Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Cam. As we approach the end of the year, I wanted to do a big cinema catch-up video and get reviews on the channel of stuff that I've wanted to talk about but have not had the chance to, because my best, worst, and over-under videos are coming as the end of the year approaches. So I wanted to talk about these movies because they've just stuck in my craw for the good or for the bad and just get them off of my chest once and for all. I've Some of these are going to be from way back at the start of the year, but I've just never had the chance to review them until right now. I anticipate this is going to be a long video, so there will be time codes linked in the description if there's one that you particularly want to hear me talk about. So without any further ado, grandstanding and hot dogging out of the way, let's get going, starting with Moonfall. Oh, geez. I'm glad no one remembers this because I've been waiting a long time to talk about this. This was directed by Roland Emmerich, director of movies like Independence Day and 2012, among others. And it follows a team of astronauts who must, well, I guess, stop the moon after a force knocks the moon out of orbit and causes havoc on the Earth. Roland Emmerich almost exclusively makes disaster movies. That's the job that he applied for, I imagine. That he, that's literally all he has ever made in his career, and some I have enjoyed. I own the steel, the Blu-ray steelbook of Independence Day. I love Independence Day. It's dumb, but it's fun. When it comes to Moonfall, though, oh boy, this one was bad. Just for the sake of being fair, there are some cast members in the movie that I thought did a admirable job, specifically Patrick Wilson, Halle Berry, and the nerdy scientist played by John Bradley. They're given pretty much nothing to work with, but they make do with what they had, which was not a lot. They give John Bradley's character quite a bit, and it doesn't work, but more on that in just a minute. But I find Patrick Wilson to be likable in pretty much anything he's in, and Halle Berry is good, so they work just fine. And some of the action is good as well. I mean, it's CGI'd to death, but it looks quite impressive. Shout out to the effects team. I hope they were paid well for this. The rest of the movie is hot garbage. The, f the first couple of parts leading up to what is revealed about the moon is actually a little interesting. Not a lot interesting, but a little interesting. But then when they reveal what is possessing this moon, it just kills the movie for me. First of all, they wheel out poor Donald Sutherland for this. That dude deserves so much better. And second of all, they do this whole thing about the moon is possessed by this alien from another galaxy and just... If you stopped caring, I do not blame you because I just did and I have the job of explaining it. The closest I can come to describing how stupid this is is comparing this movie to those Marvel comics that came out in the early 2000s. I've never read them, but I've watched Linkara's series on them. And basically, Marvel's vice president, Bill Jemis at the time, inking his various thoughts on evolution and religion and science, and no one asked for it. That goes double for Moonfall. No one asked for this, but somehow it got made. This movie is horrid. Next in line, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent was directed by Tom Gormican, and it starred Nicolas Cage, Pedro Pascal, Timothy ha er, Timothy, Tiffany Haddish, and Ike Barinholtz. And it tells the story of Nick Cage, played by Nicolas Cage. Yeah, Nick Cage is a big movie star, but he's kind of a loser in every other aspect of his life but he is hired to go to a private island by a Nick Cage superfan, played by Pedro Pascal, who is secretly in a cartel. And Nick Cage is forced to join the CIA in order to investigate him. The draw for this movie was Nicolas Cage lampooning himself for an hour 45. And for the most part, when it does do that, I was having a good time with it. I personally enjoyed Nicolas Cage as an actor. Even when he's in something bad, I still enjoy him. I mean, the man is just, he's just a national treasure with all apologies to the movie with him starring in it. I mean, 
but that movie's good. That's definitely better than you remember material, but I will save that for a later date. The movie starts him out at a pretty low point in his career, and I don't know if this was maybe Nicolas Cage turning the mirror on himself, but it was honestly a little refreshing to see that, if that was the case. Pedro Pascal is slowly becoming someone who I can thoroughly rely on whenever I see him and be like, even if the rest of the stuff is bad, he's at least going to be good. And he is good. Some of my favorite stuff in the movies when these two are just hanging out together. They connect over Paddington 2. And it's kind of heartwarming, not going to lie. When it's focused on Nicolas Cage-related stuff, it's really good. When it's focused on the CIA stuff, it's not so good. No offense to Tiffany Haddish and Ike Barinholtz, they could have been edited out of this movie and it would have been no different. If this movie would have been Nick Cage being loved by a fan, but then forcing to come to grips with the fact that he's kind of a crap human being outside of a movie set, I would have loved that. But instead they forced in this spy plot and it doesn't work. However, the movie is still a lot of fun, and I think I'm being generous, but I'm going to give this one a great rating. I think this one's pretty underrated. Play the John Moxley clip. Nope. Was directed by Jordan Peele, and it starred Daniel Kaluuya, Kiki Palmer, and Stephen Young, among others. It tells the story of a bunch of strange happenings going on at a ranch in the middle of California. The ranch is owned by a family, specifically the, fir uh, the descendants of the man who starred in the first reel of moving pictures, which was an African-American man riding on a horse. They're played by Daniel Kaluuya and Kiki Palmer. They run a business where they loan out horses for movie productions. But the strange happenings start, and it's up to them to investigate. Jordan Peele is a filmmaker that a lot of people love but I've just never understood the appeal. Don't get me wrong, the man is very talented and very funny. Just watch any Key and Peele skit. The dude is talented. But I just haven't gleaned the love that I have seen from others in the film community. I think most of them are good, but I'm just... think he's just a bit overrated. Slash me in the comments if you want to. But sitting and marinating on Nope for a little bit, I'm not going to lie, the movie has gotten better the more I have thought about it. Though there was one part, and it's not necessarily a problem, but stuff that definitely knocks it down a grade for me because of what it could have been. I will explain. First and foremost, Daniel Kaluuya and Kiki Palmer are great together. I've loved Kiki Palmer since I first saw her in the Disney Channel movie Jump In, which is highly underrated, you all should check it out. And Daniel Kaluuya has been good in pretty much everything he's been in. I mean, the dude's won an Oscar, so he's very, very good at his job. The guy that they got from the legally distinct Best Buy, played by Brandon Pereira, he's good in his role. And and the filmmaker, the, the director they get, played by Michael Wincott, a.k.a. the villain from The Crow, that was a very nice touch. And I guess this is as good a place as any to talk about the thing that is the lone hang-up for me, and that's the wasted potential of the Stephen Young character. The movie's been out for a while, so I'm going to go into a bit of spoilers, so spoiler warning. But Stephen Young's character owns this theme park based around a TV show that he starred in as a child and was vastly popular. But he starred in another TV show called Gordy's Home, which was marred by tragedy when the gorilla, the gorilla playing Gordy, went crazy on set and killed a couple of the actors and drastically maimed one of the stars to the point where she just doesn't look good afterwards. And it's hinted at that he has a lot of PTSD about it because he wants to bring some form of Gordy's home back to his theme park and it just doesn't work out for him. I honestly would have loved to have seen more done with him. And don't get me wrong, I love Daniel Kaluuya and Kiki Palmer in the movie. They were fine. But having Stephen Young and the whole Gordy's home thing in the movie feels like extra that didn't really need to be there. And it honestly felt like it could have been its own movie entirely. Have Stephen Young run this park, get his hands on some Gordy's home merch and be like, you know what could be the next big thing? This. And then kind of lean into that whole mentality of, 
would rather build a theme park and make millions of dollars for he and his family rather than go to therapy angle. I would have loved to have seen that, but it's never capitalized on. And I just, I was sitting there wondering to myself, why is this even in the movie? But overall, grand scheme, I'm going to give this movie a great rating. There's too much good in it to give it a good. However, it's not full amazing. There is stuff that I just was wondering, why is it there? Amsterdam. Oh, back to the trough we go. This was directed by David O. Russell. Here is my statement on David O. Russell. He's an asshole. The movie starred Christian Bale, John David Washington, and Margot Robbie, and a bunch of glorified cameos. It tells the story of three people played by those three actors I just mentioned, Bale, Washington, and Robbie. They all connect in the city of Amsterdam and spend a good amount of time together and get to know each other as friends. But then they drift apart. However, some sinister happenings bring them back together from their varying backgrounds. Between Thor Love and Thunder and this movie, Christian Bale just could not catch a break in 2022. The man is incredibly talented, but he had to carry Thor Love and Thunder on his back. And he was, he, Washington, and, Mar and Margot Robbie were the only three tolerable parts of Amsterdam. I wanted the movie to be about those three. Like, just have them, have the whole movie be set in Amsterdam and be about the shenanigans of those three. And then they have the, we'll always have Amsterdam moment, roll the credits. But we didn't get that. Instead, we get this very convoluted murder mystery plot that I just could not begin to care about. You couldn't pay me to care about the plot in this movie because, good lord, it is so convoluted, so messy. There are so many actors that come in and out and are almost never seen again. Mike Myers is in the movie. Shrek is in this movie for about two scenes alongside Michael Shannon and their FBI agents. Anya Taylor-Joy, bless her soul, she deserved far better than this. Her character is basically the most gaslighting person I have ever seen gaslight. I hated this character, and if that was the intent, then mission accomplished, because I wanted this character off of my screen permanently. And of course, it does the thing where the movie thinks it's a lot smarter than it actually is by bringing up various things about media and, like, like certain secret societies that want to take things over, and it just all feels so cringe. Let's just get this clip out of the way. This is the sleepiest shit I've ever seen in my life. It feels sleepy. It feels just very sad that the movie could have had an interesting premise, but just feels the need to lecture. And I just hated every minute of it. I'm going to give this one a horrid rating. Bless Christian Bale, John David Washington, and Margot Robbie. They all deserve so much more. Thankfully, Margot Robbie was in Babylon. Christian Bale is got Thor Love and Thunder to at least a good rating, in my mind. And John David Washington is going to be just fine. So thank God. Now it is time for the bottom of the barrel. Halloween ends. Oh, jeez. I should get this out of the way, but spoiler warning, there's no way I'm not going to talk spoilers here. This is the last Halloween movie, guys. This is the last one. The last one. Bullshit! I don't believe that ends crap for a second, but again, that's just, that's neither here nor there. This movie's garbage. I mean, I didn't even see it in theaters. I watched it on Peacock. Mostly because I it was a particularly busy weekend that weekend. And so I just pretty much had to watch it on Peacock. But even then, I just felt like I was robbed. There are a couple of things, though, that I did like. I will be fair. First of all, Jamie Lee Curtis. She is great. And she is, she is Laurie Strode. She owns the role. When they inevitably remake it, Again, there is no way that they can get anyone better than Jamie Lee Curtis. It just can't be done. And there are some admittedly kills in this movie that made me wince, like legitimately wince. Like probably the biggest one is when Michael Myers kills that DJ. He smashes the guy's head on the table and then grabs these scissors 
and cuts out the dude's tongue to the point where the tongue falls on the turntable and the turntable's spinning and the tongue hits the needle. So it's playing and then it hits the needle and it does it over and over and over again. That was sufficiently gross. Outside of those two things, this movie was terrible. And really, it falls on one character. And you all know exactly who it is. When it comes to Corey Cunningham, I've seen people appreciate him and others hate him. I don't know if hate is a strong word for me, but I just did not care for this person at all. I wanted to, and really it falls on this script because what is wrong with this movie? The chief problem is that it the first two thirds feels like a movie about something bad happening to the main character and trying to move on and nobody letting him. And then the last third feels like a proper Halloween movie. It felt like a Halloween movie with no first two thirds and a, and a movie about someone who does something terrible on accident, but is trying to move on that first two thirds, but no ending. And it feels completely disjointed. Oh, and don't get me started on how horrible Haddonfield is and just the physics make absolutely no sense. I'll talk about that second point first because the physics and the logic in this movie just absolutely makes no sense. And I know I'm asking for logic from a movie called Halloween Ends, but at the very least, you can make some of these kills believable because great googly... Ugh, it, it, it's terrible. There is a scene in the movie where a character returns from Halloween kills. It's the African-American lady who gets stabbed in the neck with the fluorescent light, light tube. Like, she gets stabbed there and watches her husband die. It's a horrific scene. She doesn't die from it. She appears in this movie, and her nurse chews out Laurie Strode because Laurie Strode didn't take out Michael Myers. I was just sitting there thinking, how are you alive? Like, you were stabbed in the neck with a fluorescent light tube. What are you, Nick Gage? Not to mention, I just did not care for anyone else in this town. I wanted so much to be just about Laurie and Michael finally settling their differences. But we couldn't even get that. It just had to be about Haddonfield. And I just did not care. Oh, and one more thing. Laurie's daughter, or Laurie's granddaughter is such a moron. Like, she is a complete idiot. Like, she chews Lori out because Lori is trying to protect her, and she's like, I'm running away with Corey, and you can't do anything about it. I usually reserve this clip for the clone girl from the Jurassic World trilogy, but it applies here. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but none of those words should be, look at that idiot. Halloween ends is horrid. That's all there is to it. Let's cleanse the palate by talking about Tar, a much better movie in every sense of the word. This was directed by Todd Field, who was the blindfolded piano player in Eyes Wide Shut. Yes, really. And the movie stars Kate Blanchett, and it tells the story of a composer named Lydia Tar, played by Kate Blanchett. She is the best composer in the world right now, and she is on the up and up. However, a scandal pretty much destroys her whole career. I've had a lot of time to think about this movie, like a lot of time. And now that I am sitting in front of a camera and ready to talk about it, I can safely say that while I don't think the movie is perfect, Kate Blanchett really makes the movie work. She is the best part by a country mile. She owns every scene that she is in. This movie is essentially about watching someone get canceled over the span of two plus hours. And Kate Blanchett starts out at the top of the mountain, but by the end is in, like, she starts in the gold mine and ends at the shaft. She is very brash. She is very open about how she is brash, and it does not end well for her. Let's just say that. Every scene with Kate Blanchett is great. However, most of those scenes are her sitting in a restaurant, sitting in her office, in a car on the way to the airport and it gets tiresome after a while. Not to mention that every scene is literally, or every exchange of dialogue is literally Tar talking to someone about something and then something about a scandal being brought up and she being like, it's gonna be fine when it's totally not. The first three times, it's interesting, but by four and five, it just gets really boring. Really the only scene that, the only one of those scenes that 
I personally enjoyed was when she was sitting there in a restaurant with Julian Glover, meaning that Walter Donovan and Ileana Spalco, two Indiana Jones villains, were in a restaurant eating together. I think that's kind of novel. I am going to give this a great rating. Kate Blanchett carries this movie on her back. The rest you can take or leave, but Kate Blanchett is so strong that she carries it. Fire of Love is a documentary streaming on Disney Plus through National Geographic, and it tells the story of Maurice and Katia Kraft from the late 70s to, or mid 70s, excuse me, mid 70s to the early 90s. They were incredibly prolific volcanologists. They studied volcanoes for a living, and they brought cameras with them. I heard about this movie in one of Rachel Wagner's and I's streaming previews over on her channel on the Hidden Gems podcast, and I wanted to go and see it, but it didn't come to any theater close to mine. So thankfully, Disney Plus picked it up. And after finally watching it, I'm so glad that I did, because this joins ranks of Won't You Be My Neighbor and Summer of Soul, which documentaries that I did not anticipate seeing, but I am so glad that I did. Really, this documentary is just about Katia and Maurice and just them going to volcanoes. And it gets a little old after a while, the same, oh, they're going to more volcanoes again. But the footage they were able to get in the early, like the late 70s, early 80s is unbelievably good. Like, this movie made volcanoes beautiful, even though they're absolutely horrifying. When I was watching the movie, I was thinking to myself, I was today years old when I learned that a red volcano is perfectly fine. It's the gray volcanoes you gotta worry about. I did not know that, but this movie made me learn. Like I said, it does get a bit repetitive after a while, and the narrative is loose at best, but learning about these people was just fascinating to me, and it looks absolutely beautiful. This gets a great rating. It's definitely the documentary of the year. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. This was directed by Joel Crawford and is the latest and the sequel to Puss in Boots from 2011. Wow, that's a long time. It tells the story of Puss in Boots, voiced by Antonio Banderas. After a run-in with death, let's just call him that, that's what he is called, he retires. However, he learns that there are several fa fairy tale characters going after the wishing star. So he comes out of retirement with the help of Kitty Softpaws, voiced by Salma Hayek, and his little dog Pero, to find the stone, the find the star, and return his nine lives. Just a bit of a cheap plug. I'm going to be talking about the first Shrek over on Jacob Martin's channel on on discussing DreamWorks tomorrow night. So stay tuned for that. But I've always been a fan of the Puss in Boots character. I mean, it combines two things that I love, Zorro and cats. Like, sign me up. But I didn't anticipate me loving Puss in Boots The Last Wish so much. But this movie's awesome. First and foremost, the animation is unbelievably good. Like, it's just fantastic. It combines 3D, but with, I want to say, some elements of, like, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse type of animation. I'm sure that makes sense to someone, but the animation is fast and fluid without it getting dizzying. It all works splendidly. The voice cast is all great. Antonio Banderas, Salma Hayek, they're both great in their respective roles. The Goldilocks and the Three Bears are a crime family in this movie, and they're great. The villain in the movie, other than death, is Big Jack Horner. You know, the Little Jack Horner stuck his thumb in a pie, like that guy. And he and he owns a pie empire and collects fairy tale items more hoards them, really. And it's so silly, but it all works. And then there is death. I mean, oh my god. Whenever death was on screen in the movie, I was so scared for Puss. DreamWorks is secretly crushing it this year with the bad guys and now this. And they created one of their best villains seemingly out of nowhere so congrats to dreamworks like you made me scared of wolves one of the reasons why i love the movie so much is because despite the fact that it is essentially a kid's movie it's so mature and it handles mature things so very well and it's it's got to be commended for that this one's getting an amazing grade a sleeper hit for the year 
The Fablemans was directed by Steven Spielberg and it starred Paul Dano, Michelle, Michelle Williams, and others. And this is essentially the life story of Steven Spielberg. I don't care if the last names are Fableman, it's Spielberg. This movie got a lot of buzz coming out of TIFF, and thankfully, this movie came out in, in an area where I could actually see it. Now that I have seen it, it has more than lived up to the hype. I thought the movie was fantastic. It continues to be a career year for Paul Dano. He was the Riddler earlier in The Batman, and now he isn't here in The Fablemans, and he's great. The guy they got to play young Sam Fableman as a teenager, I believe his name is Gabriel LaBelle, He's great, and I hope he gets more work after this, but easily, the star of the show is Michelle Williams. I don't really follow the Oscars all that much, but if I were running things, she would at least get a nomination, because she definitely earned it. And like I said, this is Steven Spielberg's life, basically, and I knew some things about his life, but never to the extent that it is covered in The Fablements. You can tell there is a lot of love put forth into this. Like, even so much as, like, one of the first scenes of the movie is young, young, as a boy, Sam Fableman being taken to the movies by his parents to see The Greatest Show on Earth, directed by Cecil B. DeMille, which is the film that Steven Spielberg uses in her inspiration to start his filmmaking journey. And he's done a thing or two since then. If I had to have a nit pick is some of the stuff in the high school there's definitely some there's definitely some of the high schoolers that are very anti-semitic towards sam fableman i won't repeat some of them i don't know how youtube's going to react to that so i just won't say any more but it gets bad to the point where i was just sitting there like did this really happen like or is this just upped for dramatic effect it gets to cartoonish levels and if this did happen then my apologies go out to Spielberg. I mean, he, he more than made up for it in his adult life. I mean, he's made a ton of money. He's one of the greatest of all time. So he's more than made up for it. But here, it just feels like so over the top. I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, no anti-Semite says these things. Or maybe they do. I just, I don't know. But I'm going to give this an amazing grade. This is another Spielberg just home run. Will this win any Oscars? I honestly don't know, but it's looking like it's going to be possible. Damien Chazelle, you beautiful human being. Babylon was directed by Damien Chazelle, and it starred Diego Calva, Margot Robbie, and Brad Pitt, among others. And it tells, well, three separate stories set in late 1920s Hollywood, the ending of the Silent Age and the beginning of the Sound Age. The best way I can describe this movie is a rated R version of Singing in the Rain. Like, Singing in the Rain meets Boogie Nights, if that makes any sense at all. But I loved this movie. It's not doing super well at the box office. I get why people wouldn't like this, but I love it. Like, as soon as I walked out of the theater, I was like, that's easily in my top five right there. It's Damien Chazelle directed, so of course it's going to look fantastic. The score is awesome. Shout out to Justin Hurwitz doing the Lord's work. Totally out of its mind. But that's why I love it so much, because it tells a complete story of three characters starting in 1926 and how everyone was just doing all kinds of drugs and they were making these grand, silent, epic movies of knights and just everything was clicking and they were just working on two hours of sleep and a glass of whiskey not to mention every drug known to mankind the first hour and a half of this movie is just fantastic from the very opening to when you see the opening cre the opening title 30 minutes into the movie i clocked it to the basically the ending of wrapping this big Knight's production where Diego Calva's character has to run and get rent a camera and then rush back while there is still good light like that whole first third of the movie is some of my favorite of the year Brad Pitt is great Margot Robbie is awesome she should be nominated for an Oscar and then there's Diego Calva my favorite part of this movie I hope he gets more work after this because he has earned it he is so good in this.
And like I said, this movie tells a complete story of all three of these characters in three hours. And it essentially tells everyone's rise and fall from where Brad Pitt is at the top to his descent to where Margot Robbie's character starts, gets to the top, and then comes crashing down. And then Diego Calva starts at the bottom, works his way up to the top, and sort of becomes a villain. And like I said, this movie's absolutely insane. So much insane stuff happens, I can't recap it all. Like, there is an elephant in the movie, and he takes a massive dump. You'll know when you see it. Tobey Maguire is a complete and total just weirdo in this. It's like Bully Maguire on Tony Montana's best white powder. I would understand if you don't like this movie. I have seen some people that are not big fans of this, and I totally get it. But I absolutely love this movie. Damien Chazelle is four for four. This is getting a big old amazing grade. Check this out if you have not. The Banshees of Inishirin was directed by Martin McDonough, and it starred Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell. It tells the story of two friends, or I should say former friends, who, well, in the case of Brendan Gleeson's character, pretty much calls it quits, saying that he doesn't want anything to do with Colin Farrell's character. This is another movie that got a ton of positive buzz coming out of festivals, and it didn't come anywhere near my area, but HBO Max picked it up, and I finally watched it. And this is one of the movies that I was excited for, and I was kind of disappointed over. First and foremost, the movie looks beautiful. I've been to Ireland, I love how Ireland looks, and it definitely looks like it couldn't take place in anywhere else but Ireland. The movie looks gorgeous. Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell work really well together. I mean, Brendan Gleeson just generally is great in pretty much anything he's in. Like, just put him in anything and he's great. And I've gained a new appreciation for Colin Farrell, both in The Gentleman and here. Like, he's just great. But the linchpin of this movie is these two friends are now no longer friends. And I just didn't buy it. The movie didn't really do a good job of explaining how they became friends, why they're friends, and why they broke up. Like, Brendan Gleeson's character's reasons for breaking up with, or cutting off the friendship, is that he doesn't have long to live and wants to spend his time in peace trying to create music. You can do both. That's all I'm saying. Just a very weird flex. That's my point. And honestly, it, it feels like they're just being petty. But then when, like, some truly weird and and devastating stuff happens i just didn't care because i had no reason to buy them being friends in the first place we didn't do a good job of explaining it's why i am going to give this a good rating however it is too well made to go below that however i just think this one was pretty disappointing and then let's close things out with guillermo del toro's pinocchio this is now streaming on Netflix, and it is Guillermo del Toro's adaptation of Pinocchio, a much darker version of the tale that we know. And just by this movie merely existing, it is automatically better than the Zemeckis version. Oh, the Zemeckis version. This is another movie that was hyped to the nines, and so I was excited to finally see it. And my impression of this is just, this movie is just really weird, but not in a good way. First and foremost, the animation in this is absolutely stunning. The claymation is phenomenal. The animation team, I hope they got a raise because they did deserve it. I love the voice cast, specifically Ewan McGregor, Bern Gorman, and Christoph Waltz. And all three of them are in here and they're all great. Really where my feelings, my good feelings start to depart is in the story itself and just how dark the movie feels. First of all, there are some genuinely, like, terrifying moments, like, in the bad sense. First of all, the blue fairy looks like this. JESUS! Terrifying stuff, isn't it? Now, don't get me wrong, Guillermo del Toro makes very dark movies. I understand that, and that's why I respect him. But here, it just didn't really make any sense. Like, the blue fairy's just... The blue fairy's just the tip of the iceberg. You got Geppetto kind of being a jerk to his to his creation, Pinocchio, because he misses his son way too much. I get it, but 
in the words of Sonny from My Robot, it just feels so heartless. Instead of Pinocchio going to Pleasure Island, he goes to a fascist camp with an with a Benito Mussolini avatar and just it's so weird because it just feels like it's completely out of place. I just for the commentary sake of fascism is bad. In other words, water is wet. Like what was the point of any of that? I admire Guillermo del Toro for trying a darker approach, but I don't think it worked all the way. Still, there's too much effort to not have it go unnoticed, so I'm going to give it a good rating, though this one was severely disappointing. And that's it. Thank you all so much if you did indeed made it this far. My best, worst, and over-under videos will be coming very shortly, so stay tuned for all of that, and thank you all so much for watching. If you did like the video, please be sure to leave a like, comment your thoughts down below. If you like this video and you want to see more like it, hit the subscribe button and click the bell to allow notifications. That way when a new video drops, you'll be the first to know about it. My name is Ryan Cam, and I'll see you in the next one.